covering the Universal Orlando Resort for over five years, you are listening to the unofficial Universal Orlando Podcast. Hi everyone, this is Seth Kaberski from the Orlando Weekly and Unofficial Guides. I just finished up a fantastic VIP media tour here at Universal Orlando and I'm hanging out at the Portofino Bay Hotel catch you up on some of the little things that I noticed that are new around the Universal Resort. Um, First up, over in Jurassic Park, I've heard word that there's going to be a new food and beverage kiosk. Uh, Now, I can't tell you exactly where that's going to be located or what it's going to be served, but I will keep an eye out and let you know when I know more. Second up, uh, the big news obviously this week is the Incredible Hulk. Uh, It's now officially reopened brand new track, brand new vehicles, brand new soundtrack. But there's a couple little things to look for when you get a chance to visit the Hulk. First of all, in the queue, uh, you're going to notice a lot of new high-tech additions. But a low-tech addition that's a lot of fun, uh, you'll notice some bulletin boards with some names that are shout-outs to important people in the Marvel Universe. uh, And even some folks like Stan Lee and Lou Ferrigno, the original Incredible Hulk from TV. Uh, Keep an eye out for that. And also, With the reopening of Hulk, we now have new lockers. Uh, You still have to put all your things in a locker before riding the Hulk, but now instead of scanning your fingerprint, you're going to scan your park ticket. Hopefully this will make things a little more efficient. I know a lot of people had trouble scanning their fingerprints with the old lockers. So check out those new lockers, and if they work out well, you might see them spreading uh, throughout other rides in the resort. Obviously, big new Harry Potter news recently is the release of the script book for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. That's the play that's running in London. Um, One place you're not going to find the Cursed Child right now is inside the Wizarding World. Uh, They did stock copies of the book. They sold out very quickly and they have not gotten any more back in. But if they do, you can use your annual pass discount uh, to get a little bit of savings for purchasing it there in the park. And now finally, one last thing, over at Sapphire Falls, uh, if you would like to try out some of the new dining options at Sapphire Falls, I especially recommend the Strongwater Tavern if you like ceviche and rum. Uh, Here's some great news. You can park at Sapphire Falls, and if you dine at one of the restaurants, you can get validation. Just ask your server, and you can get a ticket that will either give you free self-parking or $5 for valet parking. Um, That's a great option if you don't want to park in the main parking garage and take the water taxi over to check out the new hotel. That's what we have for this week. I'll be back in a couple more weeks with a further look at little things from around the Universal Orlando Resort. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 200, no it is 209 even though I've wrote 2009 in there, I knew it didn't look right, of the unofficial (laughs) Universal Orlando podcast. Uh, This is a producers club roundtable which means no Tracy, no Darren, no Hunter. But I am joined by three members of our producers club. Introducing first from New Jersey, Miss Alison Schilberg. Hey Ali. Hello. Oh, that was very sweet. And from the, the the state that's currently burning, apparently, Wisconsin, Mr. John Tyler. Hello there. How are you doing, John? Real good. How are you, Lee? Putting everyone's voices to shame. I am good, thank you. I'm sorry. I, uh, I'll, I'll try and talk less authoritatively. <laughs> Let's see if someone else can challenge you for how hot it is. And finally, from the sunshine state of Florida, Mr. Leo Gibson. Hey, Leo. Hello, everyone. How warm is it in Florida at the moment, Leo? It is about 98 with... 98% humidity. It is roasting. Anyone else challenge that? That's Jersey, too. <laughs> that's about <laughs> where we were. Thing. Yeah, that's where we were the last week. And <laughs> it just started cooling off today. I'm complaining because it's hot here in England, but not that hot. <laughs> <laughs> we're sweating and like complaining it's too hot, and it's probably, I don't even know what it is in different measurements and stuff because we use Celsius and you use Fahrenheit, and I have no idea what the conversion is. Anyway. <laughs> Right. Uh, the topic of this roundtable chat was actually something that crossed my mind when I was interviewing Ron Schneider a couple of weeks ago about the celebrity lookalikes. Character meet and greets, and not just necessarily meet and greets, but characters in the parks overall have changed substantially over the years. And it's interesting now to see where things are were and where things are now and then potentially where we're going to see them in the future. 
Um, because I still think they're a big part of theme parks overall. But it's interesting to see with the updates in technology nowadays where we're going to see that happen in the future. So uh, what I wanted to do first off, because I will moderate this and make sure everyone has their say. John, remember your place. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry already. <laughs> everyone will be like, no, no, let him talk. I like that voice. All the girls will be swooning. Hey, baby. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do first off is actually just go around and ask everybody what their thoughts on meet and greets actually were, like characters in the park overall, whether you're a, a character person or not or whatever. So, Ali, are you, a, are you a character person or is it something you tend to skip? It It depends on the character. So if it's something that I am extremely passionate about, like, say... If there was a Beetlejuice in the park, I would probably seek that out specifically. But yeah, it would just it would depend on the character and the and the attraction, I think. Okay. Other than that, it's a hit or miss for me. Yeah. It's either or. You're either interested because of the character or if it's or you're not, basically. Fair comment. Yeah, exactly. John thought originally, and this comes from being a guy who goes to Six Flags a lot. <laughs> character interaction to me was nothing it you know i wasn't interested at all um flash forward i have three small kids who are now a little bigger and they love them and then when i saw them getting into it and really enjoying it i started enjoying it more because they were having such a good time yeah and i then that's when i started enjoying it and what really but when you know you know you're having a really good one, when they kind of pull you in, when all of a sudden you forget just for a moment, at least on some level, that this is a character, you know this or this is an actor playing a character. Spoilers, <clears throat> <clears throat> kids, cover your ears. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not true. It's lies. I'm telling you. No, um, oh, you've killed it now, man. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am the uh, yeah. usurper of dreams again. <laughs> <sighs> My wife had dreams, and I ruined those too. <laughs> but uh, <sighs> yeah, she's going to hear this, and I'm going to hear about it. Um, I can edit it out if you no, want. But, no, it's good. <laughs> um, trust me, she's used to uh, you know looking at me and, go, and rolling her eyes. It's entirely a thing after 13 years. Yeah, I know that. But but uh, oh yeah, well, every married guy does. <laughs> yeah, but and, you get to hear it on the air. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and once again, she's used to it. Long, I, I call her long-suffering wife for a lot of reasons. But um, getting back to the characters, I never thought I'd enjoy them as much as I do. Um, now I really do. So Cool. Right. Leo, thoughts? Because you're the one in Florida. Surely you must visit the parks fairly regularly. Oh, yes. We're, I'm at the parks at least twice a year. Um, Is that all? I, I do have to work to be able to afford to go to the park. Fair so, <laughs> uh, I do live five hours from the park. So okay. it's, not, it's 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 a little harder just to just swing down for a day. Um, I'll preface this by saying, huge geek and kid at heart. Um, so I have always loved the character meet and greets and the and um, the characters in the streets and whatnot. Um, scooby-doo seeing the mystery machine um transformers doc brown all of them um for me these are all things that i grew up with and loved so much so the opportunity to be able to meet and see them um even if it's you know i mean you know i'm a 30 year old man i know they're not the characters i that were in the shows i watched as a kid but still it's just i see them and i become that 10 year old boy and so that's I guess my opinion on it. Uh, here's a question, because like when, when I spoke to Ron, one of the things he said when they first started was that the characters they had in the parks, it was very impromptu. That basically you would just walk into the parks, and I think he said they had the Marx Brothers were playing Pinochle with a group of guests outside the Beverly Hills Boulangerie. Um, <laughs> has anybody been going to the parks long enough that they would have potentially seen those characters doing that type of interaction? What's the earliest anybody he has been going since? Yeah, I didn't go back in those days, no. Yeah, I don't think I was ever that. My first trip to Universal was 2005. 
Yeah. So that probably was before then. Yeah. Uh, Ali, when did you first go? Um, 12 years ago. I was 13. And um, I don't really remember. The only characters I really remember being out even were like Lucy and Ricky, um, the Mystery Machine. But even then, it wasn't really like a ton of interaction with anybody. Yeah. Not like that anyway. No. John, when did you first go? I am a newbie. It was two years ago. Really? And yeah, and I wow. I fell in love with them. Now now, you have to remember, I used to live in Alaska. Right, you took care. Getting friend. me oh getting me to a Florida <laughs> was probably the most difficult thing my wife ever did. Now she has been going. She lived in Florida when she was a kid, and she was in dance troops that danced at both Disney and Universal and all kinds of stuff. Um, so she was very familiar and. It, she kind of eased me into it and then twisted my arm and got me down there down to Disney for two weeks uh, with, the, with the family. And, um, you know, <laughs> it's a dirty word on always, this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But it was that trip went well enough and we did it in the wintertime yeah. that I knew I wanted to go to Universal for a long time because, first of all, I am a full on adrenaline junkie. I. You know, I was a paratrooper in the army. I ride, you know, a thousand CC, uh, motorcycle. I want, you know, I love going fast and doing dangerous things. So I wanted to go where the thrill rides were. And the whole time we were down there last time I was, you know, at, at Disney, I should say the first time down at Disney, I was like, you know, this is nice. This is great. I want to go ride something. So you went to Bush Gardens. And so <laughs> no, I stayed at Disney and was the uh, the good family man. And then I surprised my wife and brought her back down to Universal again. And we stayed down there for a week and had a blast. And uh, it's Universal is much more my parks. Yeah. Um, and you know I've been going to theme parks since I was a little boy, but they were all the the, the Six Flags variety kind of stuff. Um, and basically the characters there are just. You know, your, your standard costume, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck kind of thing. They walk around. It's a quick photo up. And I think now the uh, you, you have the Streetmosphere characters, but you almost have to put things into certain categories. Um, in the really heavily themed Harry Potter lands, which was my wife's primary focus for going there. She's a huge Potterhead. That's what she wanted to do. Almost everybody working there, if they're doing, if they're taking it seriously and really doing their job, it's almost a character interaction just talking to a, a team member. I feel because, it can be a little bit hit and miss, though. I know when we went out last year, I was expecting a lot of interaction in Borgen and Burks, especially with having the Dark Mark tattoo, and they were too busy talking about what they were doing tonight after they'd finished work. I was a little bit disappointed, if I was honest. Yeah, That's I've why had I the qualified same, it. I've had the same... Um, experiences lay, especially in Borg and Burks. I've heard only good things where, you know, they get really into it with you and they, they're they like mean almost, but they, it was it was sad. <laughs> it just didn't happen. Do you think it's played up a little bit too much that you uh, that you go in expecting it and if you don't I, I mean, at the end of the day, they are people. I don't know how much sort of direction those team members are given to be a certain character because at the end of the day there's still a person working in a shop right i don't oh, know absolutely it is part of their job to enhance yes. the experience and some of them do a great job of it and you remember those ones yeah but it yeah. seems to be or at least what we found last time it's those ones that they are that are actually the characters the night bus conductor the um the hogwarts express conductor now they are fantastic mm -hmm. but they're the only ones that are really characters yes in those two parts of the parks yeah because I, i'd heard when they originally opened hogsmeade that they had people just playing random witches and wizards wandering around not really interacting with people just sort of enhancing yeah, the uh, experience i definitely remember seeing those but i mean if you got to interact with them it was really cool but they weren't like seeking people out to interact with them. Yeah. We had two really good team members who were were playing the part well. One at the Leaky Cauldron, a guy named Lee, actually. Yeah. And <laughs> um, one of the, I don't remember her name, but uh, she was one of the young ladies out helping with the wands. 
and she was outstanding. She did a great job. Job. Nobody there had an English accent, which I found disappointing. Yes, but they it, those two in particular were really in character. Oh, then there was another one in uh, Ollivanders. The the girl who helped us was outstanding. Was that in Diagon Alley or in Hogsmeade? Diagon Alley. See, I found. I, see, I think my my experience last time was tampered a little bit or tempered, whatever the word is by my experience in Hogsmeade in, in 2013 because I went and I had so much interaction with, as like you said, in, in um, whatever the one shop, it's not Ollivander's where you get, it, is it, it's Ollivander's the experience and then the shop attached to it is, oh God, I can't remember. Um, but Neither. That should have been one for the quiz last week. Uh, <laughs> I can't, I, I can't remember. That's terrible. Shoot me now. The, the the competing wand shop. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, is it Dervish and Banks? There you go. And the uh, my two kids bought their ones, and I was getting chastised all up and down for having the dark mark, and they were they were making the kids promise that they wouldn't do dark magics because they'd end up in Azkaban like the dad had been and stuff, and that was you know it's such good interaction, and I think that because we didn't get any, that made it obviously worse. What's your experience of sort of interaction in, in let's go hugs me and diagonally specifically, Leo? Um, so my, my, my standout um, experience with a character uh, at the Wizarding World was my very first trip. Um, of course, went specifically for Wizarding World. Um, I had been living in California at the time, so I never experienced Hogsmeade until Diagon Alley opened. Right. Um, oh, interesting. So I went, you know, planned two days, did the first day, just did Diagon Alley the first half of the day, then took the train over into Hogsmeade the second half of the day. Just wanted to really just immerse myself in just that aspect of the parks. Um, picked up my, um, got my robes, wand, everything while I was in Diagon Alley, and then went to Hogsmeade. Um, as I'm go was going to ride Forbidden Journey, um, the um, I guess ride attendants or whatever at the front of the ride, letting people in, noticed. Of course, I was decked out in Ravenclaw, and um, he was a um, Slytherin, and <laughs> I noticed him really interacting and really getting into character with anybody with Gryffindor or anything else, and. Um, you know, I stopped and, and spoke with him for a few moments because there was, it was really crowded and I kept getting cut off and, and everything. And just that experience with that, I wish I could remember, remember his name, um, but with that, that one team member and just how in character and, and even when I was just stopped and was talking to him while he was while working, he never broke character once. And that really, for my first trip there, and it was my first time really um, interacting with any of the the members at either side of the Wizarding World, it really left an impression. It's awkward though, as well, because that set your that set your expectations. So if you go anywhere else and don't get that interaction, you're like, oh, well, he's a miserable get. <laughs> yeah, I've gone back in subsequent visits since. Um, I've had some some. I guess you could say disappointing moments. Um, the most, the the biggest one being um, uh, an employee at uh, the Leaky Cauldron um, that was just actually was almost downright rude. Really, um, and that one was just yeah that that one left a bad taste in my mouth. But um, you know, I I tried tried to move on and not let not let it affect my day. So. It's got to be difficult because when you think how many team members you're going to interact with over the course of a day in those parks, and let's be honest, everyone has a bad day. There's days when you wake up and you think, I don't want to talk to anybody today. <laughs> and I'm lucky oh, yeah. that in my job, I can put my headphones in and if I don't want to talk to anyone, I don't have to. But they have to. Right. I'm going to bring it up, right? Because one of the things that Ron brought up was the uh, the Living Character Initiative that Disney have, have brought in. So if you look at now, I think it's in Town Square, you've got the talking Mickey, where it is actually a talking head, but the person in the Mickey suit, that's right, it is a person in a suit. We're gonna we've already we've already established that. Um Fourth wall broken. <laughs> but it <laughs> like it's a live interaction. 
like you would get with a face character. And that was the problem is when you meet someone like Shrek, it's a guy in a suit with a big fake head on. And those interactions are awkward. Uh, Our family have always kind of struggled with those meet and greets because the kids don't really know what to do. They're quite shy as Neither it is. Neither do the adults. Yeah, but it's it's <laughs> awkward because you can't really talk to the... It's like it's a really uncomfortable interaction at times. We've had good interactions with non-face characters, but it's an awkward one. And we're starting to see more of that. You look at like Turtle Talk. It all seems to be Disney that are innovating. We've got it a little bit at Universal. Uh, the Mystic Fountain's the, uh, a really good example. I love that. I could spend hours there. Um, and the Shrunken Head at the... Uh... yes. Night bus, yeah, um, he's I, awesome. You know the night the night bus conductor, conductor, and the shrunken head were the best character interactions we had. Um, we were lucky. We the early park entry hours for uh, on site guests were in Hogsmeade, and we ignored them and then went to Diagon Alley that morning. And uh, there was nobody over there, and we, we actually got to stand there and talk to them for I'd say a good ten minutes uninterrupted. Awesome. And oh. They killed it. The, first of all, whoever was uh, doing the shrunken head, unbelievably timely, funny, did a did a killer job of that. Well, but we all the, know the one night- of the guys that does the shrunken head. I'm sure you are aware mm-hmm. of him. Um, I'm not going to name him by name, but uh, a certain clown from Halloween Horror Nights is one of the people that does the shrunken head. Oh, wow. Ah, okay. And, yeah, yeah they, they crushed it. That's awesome. But it's like, um, one of the things that's really annoyed me, there's the Universal Studios Hollywood got the interactive meet and greets with the Transformers. And if you go on YouTube and search any of those videos, Megatron is unbelievable. Like, just ripping people to bits. It's hilarious. (laughs) Now, they tested it in Orlando for one day. That's it? One day, they set it all up. Oh they God. did it for maybe four hours. The reason they gave for not continuing it was because of uh, the language b- barriers, because they had so many South American guests. My what? my issue with that is, literally across the street, you've got Donkey's Photo Finish, which is virtually the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't close that down. I don't understand that. That makes no sense. I feel like they would that would bring so many more people to that part of the park, which really doesn't have that much going on at the moment. No, it's a thoroughfare from... Other than, like, attractions, but... Yeah, but it's a thoroughfare. Yeah, that it, street where the Transformers are is a thoroughfare from Rip Ride Rocket over to sort of kids' zone right. area. Right. Yeah, it's someplace you just walk through. Right. And, you know, they put so much effort into the costume animatronic for Megatron there it to take it that one step further they just should have done it I, I don't understand it because it would people would go we, they would flip out for it if you were if you had a, a meet and greet with those characters and they were referencing you by not necessarily name but you know what I mean like if you had a certain t-shirt on they were like oh, like because uh, I've seen uh, like football jerseys that type of thing people get ribbed for whatever team they support. That would be brilliant. You know, kids would go crazy for it. I know they've kind of done it with Bumblebee a little bit where they'll play specific music for... It's kind of interactive, but not really. Right. I'm not even a big fan of Transformers, but I would... If that was an option, I would make a stop and interact just to have that experience. It's such an impressive, you know, visual. And... You know, there should be more to these interactions than just a photo op. Um, it, you know, you, to help. Also, it makes for a better picture when you're into it anyway. Yes. But, you know, let's face it, a lot of the, the costume characters think it's, you're there f- to get a picture and sign a, a book if you're into that. And it's really the, the face characters who have the real interactions and can draw you into it with yeah. their actions. And, you know, because... They have language to put context to things. Yeah. Well, there's a question, you, something you've just brought up there. How do we feel about autograph books? Are we for or against them? I will state my claim now. I, I don't think they should be a thing. Yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree. I'm the outlier. My kids love them <laughs> and still look at their books. So, eh. 
I think it's good for Disney, but for Universal, no. I don't even know whether Universal actually sell autograph books to them. You tend to see a lot of people with Disney books in Universal. I, I have I have seen them. I'm not, once upon a time I've seen them in the Universal um, gift shops around the parks. Um, can't say that I've seen them recently, but I know they've had them in the past. I'm trying to remember because we we booked through a a travel agent who does Universal packages, and we got this whole you know box of stuff swag, as it would be, and I don't think there was a an autograph book in there. And I know that when we booked our Disney one like that, we did get one from them. So, mm. you know, obviously it's not the priority. It just, it, it becomes an awkward thing, doesn't it? I think I don't, I feel like there isn't enough characters to really get an autograph enough to fill up an entire book anyway, within both parks. It's well, yeah, because yeah, Disney you're right. with Disney character meet and greets is such a huge thing, and I think that Universal are missing a trick with it because, let's be honest, a lot of the traffic in Orlando to, that's going to Universal are still the the sort of fallout from Disney. People will go to Orlando to go to Walt Disney World and then think, oh, we'll have a couple of days at Universal. I still think that probably seventy percent of the people that are there are there because of Disney and will go to Universal because it's there. And they're already there, rather than making the trip to Universal and going to Disney. And right. I think if people have gone to Disney and they're expecting that meet and greet character thing, then go to Universal. They'll be disappointed. I think they're missing a trick because a it's taking people out of the lines for the rides, mm-hmm. and b you know a lot of the characters in Universal because they try and stay on the cutting edge of pop culture. You're going to meet characters that are now to a certain extent. Right. And like well, the the thing with you know, Disney too is every single character that they have in the parks, they're already trained from the get-go to know that autograph by heart without even having to look down at the paper. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's like that whole thing too, but yeah. I would almost possibly even point out the um a big difference between a lot of the newer meet and greet experiences at Universal versus the meet and greet experiences that you typically get at Disney. Um, if you look at Universal, some of the newer ones, Transformers, it's near impossible to get an autograph from one of the Transformers characters yes. because of the their suit they're in. You have the Raptor encounter, which <laughs> you're interacting with the Raptor. You can't exactly get a autograph from the Raptor. You <laughs> you have um, you know the the Wizarding World characters, the condu- the conductor and the night bus operator which that very well could come into play with Warner Brothers and J.K. Rowling, um, how they have very much veto power in anything that happens in that universe. Mm. So some sort of pass stamp for that one. They kind of played a, played a character, played a type there. That would be cool. Yeah. Like stamp. Yeah. Night bus pass. Yeah, that would be brilliant. Yeah, that would. Uh, I like that. And, and conversely, right now I don't think there's much hotter of a problem property part of me um then there is marvel and the marvel characters out there and they are that would be really easy for them to do that kind of thing see i think one of the things universal is missing out i know they've just changed the name of it but the photo connect whatever it's called now is it my universal photos let's let's not even let's not even discuss that name because it's terrible (laughs) but there's if you like i i think the the price for the package is good the problem is there's not many photographers around the parks yeah you don't really see them around you get your obligatory sort of globe shot and maybe the one in front of the bridge in islands of adventure but for the like the the character meet and greets as such the, uh, I don't think the night bus conductor has one. The uh, the Hogwarts Express conductor doesn't have one. I think the Transformers do. It's not really set up. And you think, like, a lot of the pictures that, if you get Disney's photo pass, a lot of the, the better pictures you're going to get are those ones that they'll capture during the interaction itself rather than the posed-for photograph. Yeah. That's so weird. I it's, thought at least Stan had one, but I guess not. It may not be a consistent thing, but I've I've actually have one hanging on my wall of a of a picture taken with the night bus and the night bus conductor. Okay. 
by a universal photographer. It may be just that it depends on what who they have staffed and time of year, how they uh, schedule the photographers. I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I think I have one. We, we went the off season. There was none. There was none there. I definitely have a picture from two Halloweens ago in front of the night bus, but then not last Halloween. I've been there on Halloween day. This will be the third year I'm going. So I guess it does depend. Yeah, but because they're really pushing it now, and it's there's very few. It's like even the ride photos, um, because I remember going back in 2004, and the Men in Black uh, on ride photo had, we're getting completely off topic here now, um, used to put your score on it, and now they don't. Oh, yeah. Which is weird. Mm. And are there men in black around in the parks? Because I have never seen them. Yes, we I go, we met them last time we were there. They're quite good, actually. Where, yes. Where do they usually, like, hang? I don't even know. Um, it's just so weird to me. They were in front of the ride last time, but we've seen them hanging around in uh, sort of outside of the Brown Derby hat shop round sort of as you go into Hollywood oh. we've seen them there because they tend gotcha. to put a lot of the characters around there as a bit of a speed bump with people right. coming into the parks right but there's not many free roaming characters now as well I think that's something that the parks and I think it's probably a, a product of the parks being as busy as they are now but everything seems to yeah. be it's very regimented here's the line get in the line there's your 30 second minute interaction with the character get your autograph and bugger off yeah. Whereas those impromptu ones, I think, are much better. Like the Doc Brown. I don't know whether Doc Brown has a specific schedule. He just happens to turn up and it's... You catch him, you catch him. If you don't, you don't. And he's... I think there's one guy specifically who's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, anytime I've seen him around, it's been great. And he's in character, on point, every single time. I think the interest... I think last time... Sorry, Sorry, go, go on. No, you're... Um, last time I was there, I asked for a selfie with him, and he was like, what does that mean? You know, he started freaking out, but yeah. he took it anyway. It was really cool. But that's that's the type of interaction you want, where they, they exactly. act in character. Exactly. Like, I know um, when Diagonally first opened, you were hearing a lot of people that would, like, be uh, coming out with cell phones and stuff, and the team members would be like, oh, what's that strange contraption you've got there? And then you don't, I've never seen that. <laughs> Which is yeah, disappointing. I, either. Um, I had that uh, when we were there last. They were definitely asking uh, several people um, in Diagon Alley gave that that same response when I'd pull out my my phone or uh, my wife would, you know, one day we went in there with a tripod and her big camera just to get shots in the afternoon as the sun was setting, and a couple of the cast members came over and asked about it in in character. So awesome. I th- you know we. We might have had a a really good period, you know. Maybe they they just uh, reminded everybody, "Hey, try to interact in character or something." But we had a good bit of it. It could have been as well, John, that if you went at a quiet a time, they've got more time to be the characters they want to be, rather than thinking, "Well, we've still got to get all these people through whatever it is we've got to get them through." And you can't always interact with everyone because the, if you are trying to interact with every person, you're adding seconds onto getting them into the queue for the Hogwarts Express or whatever. It's all time, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's yeah. a really good point. They you know they had time to think about themselves rather than just I got to get this job done. Yeah, because I kind of came off right. Forbidden Journey the first few times we rode that when they load you onto the actual benches. I was expecting a bit of interaction there, and we didn't get it. And I think it comes from the fact that it, they've just that they they're on their job. It's like we've got to get these people loaded on these benches as quick as we can, especially with it being a constantly moving thing. We can't afford to interact with people because we've got to get it loaded and keep that line moving. Right. Yeah, I, actually, I think the ride, the workers in the ride, the cast members in the rides were the least interactive and least in character that we dealt with. Mm. Um, it was all the the people on the streets helping out with the wands, the the people in the shops. They were the ones who who were more in character and more in, in theme. I know it was last time we went. I've still got. I think the audio went out on our the show we recorded while we were over there. Tracy Tracy's hair was green at the time. I think it was the uh, the shrunken head that asked her if she was a metamorph magus. 
can you change your hair at will? And he asked her, and she's like, yes, I do. Oh, my God. Oh, it's just little bits That's like great. it. Awesome. Like, I love that. That's yeah. like, like you all said before, that it's bits like that that shrink you down to that 10-year-old kid again. And you totally believe mm-hmm. that that person stood in front of you is the night bus conductor. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, well, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, the eighth wonder of the world is returning to Universal Orlando Resort. So let our friends at Fairy Godmother Travel take care of the resort reservation. They are a Universal Parks and Resorts specialist, as well as being an authorised Disney vacation planner, and their service is free to you. From the awesome Cabana Bay Hotel to those other hotels run by a mouse, Fairy Godmother Travel can book all your Orlando vacation needs, so you don't need to miss the chance to see the amazing King Kong in the flesh. And please make sure to let them know that you heard about Fairy Godmother Travel because of UUOP. Because every UUOP referral helps us to continue to bring you the greatest universal coverage. Contact them today by phone at 832-284-4002 or toll free at 888-939-642539 or go to fairygodmothertravel.com. Let Fairy Godmother Travel make your next vacation magical. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Hello everyone and welcome back. You are listening to the Producers Club Roundtable and we are discussing characters in the parks. Uh, Where we go next? Um, Actually, one of the things that I've noticed seems to be coming into the parks and we've kind of discussed it a little bit already is... Uh, how would you describe it? It's kind of a passive interactive meet and greet, so kind of like the Shrunken Head, kind of like the Mystic Fountain. We've got the one in the Money Exchange in Gringotts. How do we feel about those types of characters in the parks? I would Uh, love more of them. Right. Rather than an actual person, are you happy with interacting with a sort of inanimate or sort of slightly animate object? No problem with it. Yeah, me yeah, either. I, and, and I think with Universal Creative kind of putting themselves in the right mindset, it's an easy way to add a little bit of extra entertainment for guests in just about any area. Um, yeah, agreed. I know when we sort of, when we went into the money exchange, I was trying to work out how interactive that goblin actually is. I don't think it's an actual person. I think it has specific phrases that can be activated by a button. It would I would rather it was like the Mystic Fountain or like the Shrunken Head where it was an actual person interacting with you. But then it it, it I think a lot of it comes down nowadays to its its budget. You're starting yeah. to see a lot of attractions that you know, we hoped when when they first announced Skull Island Reign of Kong and I suppose this kind of goes to characters a little bit that we heard we were going to get the drivers were going to be live actors. And what we got was a basic animatronic. Has anybody ridden that yet on here? No. Unfortunately not. Not yet. I'm looking October. forward to it. <laughs> I think I've got a right through. Oh, three weeks, sir. <laughs> but you you see like you a, know. On, if if you have a a semi automated animatronic interaction, oh, that's a lot of big words. <laughs> it, and it just adds another layer of theming of interaction, something you know to pull you in. And it's probably cheaper to have one person. You don't have to. It's not a performer. It's not you know that there is a different pay scale between performers versus the cast members, you know, who are just sitting there. And if they can just trigger, you know, one of 20 phrases and you have that one person, you know, maybe out front, maybe sitting behind the scenes, it's a little easier on them. You know, that's probably a more cost effective way to do it than to have the, the voice person sitting there and someone there controlling, you know, maybe lighting or coming in and you know the cameras that they're going to have to have for the voice person to see the person interacting up front and know what they're doing and know what they're wearing so it probably is a more cost effective way to do it and yeah. i'm all for it 
because I mean, even like the goblins in the Gringotts queue, they're not necessarily interactive, but as characters in the park, they bring an uh, an extra atmosphere to the to that queue. I I wish they did kind of interact with you, especially if you're waiting all the way back there. Yeah, I feel like that would be cool. But again, cost effective. It is, and that's what it comes down to. That's why you're not seeing as many attractions now with live team members. Um, it right. seems to be more performances now rather than just sort of actors in the park. I mean, I'm surprised something like the horror makeup show is still there. You know, we're hearing rumours at this point that Terminator 2 3D might be the next on the chopping block. Yeah. For what it have heard it's going for, I'm not for it, but let's not get down that route. You know, but you look at the actors <laughs> you look at the actors well, in that and they're fantastic. And I know they used to a long time ago, they would bring those actors out to meet and greet on the street, but I I've never seen them out. Oh. I've seen them once. Really? Yeah, me too. Yeah. So a while that, ago. That would be awesome. Because let's be honest, everybody still knows who the Terminator is. It's true. At least if you bring in your yeah, kids that was, right. culture. That was also at a time when they still had a lot of characters out in that street. Yeah. And they just don't do it anymore. No. I mean, they've, they've tried to a little bit more with the Superstar Parade. So you've got those, like the parade comes out, but then they also do the sort of, um, like stop off meet and greets during the day. But again, they're all sort of non-face characters. And it's, what kind of meet and greet experience can you get with someone who can't talk to you right hey it's lee can i bring up one. something oh i'm sorry um no, lee, can i bring up something that you hate and love at the same time <laughs> actually two different things one you hate one you love i've watched the video for the walking dead walk through in hollywood and honestly not all that impressed but it looked like there were some live actor zombies there yes so I know you love live actors yes. in the parks, but you hate The Walking Dead. I don't hate The At Walking Dead, the wa- it's just boring. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, and after watching the videos of that, I, I kind of agree. I'm, I'm not happy. And if that's what they're going to pull uh, Terminator for, I poo-poo it right now. But it's one way of getting new, uh, you know working actors in the park. So yeah, any mixed feelings? But then you look at what it if it if it does replace T two three D, you've got at least five actors, four actors in that already. How many are they gonna put in there? Well, is the walkthrough house like a live horror nights house? Like where they have like tons of people playing zombies just constantly it, all day? It it is. Um I actually thanks to work got to experience it um go awesome. to universal awesome. hollywood um two weeks ago so i i did a quick morning of it stopped and you know did all the things that have changed since i moved from california i got to go through the um the walking dead walk through um there are zombie um live actor characters as well as um, survivor characters they seem to be at a minimum this time of year. One of the things they're hyping up for Hollywood's Halloween Horror Nights this year is that they're going to be drastically increasing the number of actors inside the Walking Dead attraction. Yeah. And then in the off season, um, it seems like they're doing very much what they did with the House of Horrors, which was their um, their walk through haunt year round haunt previously. Was there are characters um, inside? But they really seem to be at a minimum. When I was there through the walkthrough, I think I counted six total live right. actors in the oh, house, wow. and that was it. So, how was it compared to like your typical Halloween Horror Nights house, then, Leo? Um, I would say, in terms of its the the overall design and everything, because obviously it had a bigger budget than a typical Halloween Horror Nights house did. Those, of course, you know, those are built to, to withstand, you know, a month and a half and two of, you know, abuse yeah. and then are <laughs> torn down. This one, of course, is going to be around for many years. It is actually extremely impressive, uh, much more so than I thought when I watched the, uh, the walkthrough videos ahead of time. Like the burning cabin scene, I thought looked well on camera. In person, it was breathtaking. I mean, it looked really? so good. 
Yeah, it wow. really did. It was, it was really. I w- turned that corner and saw it, and it was like, whoa. So it was. I was actually pleasantly surprised by the overall experience. I mean, I'm not the biggest Walking Dead fan, and I know in Orlando, ex- especially, we've kind of a lot of people have hit the Walking Dead overload. Um, <laughs> what is this year five? Of it coming to Halloween Four Horror Nights. Yeah, and Darren was bored um, after year two. <laughs> yeah, it's um, so when you when you just kind of look at how well they pulled it off, it is it extremely well done with uh, effects and gags that they would never be able to do in a regular Halloween Horror Nights house, which kind of made it, it, it interesting in that aspect at least. How long was it, Leo? Not long. I think it took about about the length of a typical Halloween Horror Nights house, so it took maybe three and a half, four minutes to walk through. Right. Um, if that, wow. not very long. But I know they designed it that way specifically with areas within it that they can add scenes as the show goes on. Okay. So add additional scenes, like so after the next season they can go in and add scenes from the season that just ended. Now here's a question for you. Did they pulse it through? Did you go through in groups, or was it just? Did you just let people sort of go in as they walked up? When I went, I made a. I got there as soon as it opened and made a beeline to that. So I was maybe the third person let through that morning. Right. Um, and I really didn't see the line anymore that day to be able to really tell if it was if they were letting people in in just like small groups at a time or going straight through. I know when I did. House of Horrors years ago, um, they did it by um, so many at a time. It wasn't just like, oh, you're a group of four, okay, go. And then waiting, it was, they would let maybe 10, 15 go through and then break. And then another 10 to 15 go through and break. See, it just worries me that if ends up coming like Halloween Horror Nights where it gets that busy, it's just a big conga line. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny you've kind of brought that up. I actually, uh, the best sort of interactive character meets we've had probably in the last couple of visits, visits was actually at Halloween Horror Nights last year. Yeah. Well, isn't Halloween afraid. Horror Nights kind of the ultimate interact um, character interaction? I mean, there's so much, so much there and so many characters and... You know, the whole thing. It is, but I found, like, uh, going through the houses, not so much, because it is literally a case of scary set, scary set, scary set. It was more in the street that we found. Um, I mean, outside... Yeah, the, the, the uh, Did you go last year, Ali? Yeah, I went last year and the year before. So, like, last year they had the Barker out um, in front of the Purge house, so we had a bit of interaction with him, which was cool. Um, I never got to see him, and I was so angry. That was awesome, because awesome. we all, Tracy made us all um, blue flower pins for the RIP tour. So when we did that, obviously, we were showing our our blue flowers off. So we got a bit of interaction <laughs> with that. Tracy actually got one of the actors in The Walking Dead maze to come out of character to tell her uh, that he liked a tattoo. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But for us, it was it was the icons in Icon Alley. Um, Jade, our youngest, I've said this before on the show, had one of the greatest character interactions I have ever seen with the Usher. And it uh, it just made the entire trip. He was superb. The story you tell about uh, him writing Jade's name and blood on the window. Yes. As a father, I still don't know how I feel about it. Oh, that. no, it was awesome. <laughs> and she loved it. Oh, if you ever met her, that, that made her night. She was just like, ah, oh, but it was just so cool. Um, awesome. But yeah, I mean, with Horror Nights, like I was worried last year because we hadn't been since 2004 and I was expecting everything to just be, it's like, right, we're going to go through the houses. You're going to get pushed through it as quick as you can. You're not going to get a chance to see anything. You're not going to get any sort of intimate moments that's it and it wasn't that at all i mean i I think i said it back on the review ali did you happen to see the stooge that they planted in the purge house no maybe i'm not sure um i was walking along and a girl came out of nowhere 
just kind of uh, we could come round the corner and she was stood there and she just said to me oh I, i've lost my friends in line can i do you mind if i cut in and catch them up and i went oh, yes okay oh my god and we walked round the corner a scare actor jumped out from the side, grabbed hold of her and like pretended to slit her throat and dragged her behind the scenes. I was like, oh my God, that was fantastic. <laughs> I think I saw that too. I think we went through like twice that house last year. And I think, horror, like John, you've said it totally there. The ultimate character interaction experience is probably Horror Nights at this point. And, with, uh, and those nights are so busy, yet they still manage to pack them in. It, it amazes me how they do it and I wish the parks could learn from that a little bit more it blows my mind that they can't do that because they do it for two months straight and then they just like lose it the rest of the year but is that a but budget it is a thing? premium ticketed event yes yeah yeah that's you're true. paying extra for that experience and even that's more true. this year with the <laughs> yeah. new uh, VR walk <laughs> every thing. year yeah, but if you want to do the whole experience, this I mean, I've said it, we spent for four of us to do one night with Express, the RIP tour, and then a third night cost us $1,500 last year. Oh, my God. And I know That's the tickets insane. have gone up even more this year, plus you've got this new um, sort of four group virtual reality house coming in as well if you want to do everything you're parting with a fair amount of money but i think yeah. it's worth every penny there's a reason why that is a reason why you go obviously you you have become a convert and i assume you're going this year yeah i don't like you definitely. anymore <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> i mean i was i was hooked from like two years ago i went with my cousin for the first time ever and we had the stay and scream ticket. Yes. So we went into Finnegan's for dinner and it was on Halloween night. It was the only night we were going and we were sitting by a window and it was the purge scare zone right, right outside of Finnegan's. And this girl had blonde hair, one of those like human masks on and a knife. And she, my cousin was shit scared <laughs> of this girl <laughs> and that scare zone and she followed us around she wasn't even inside because they're obviously not allowed inside but she followed us around until we came out of finnegan's for more than a half hour awesome and just kept scaring my cousin yeah. so like since then it, it you there's just no comparison it's just yeah it's great that's how the character interaction should be. I mean, we noticed walking through specifically last year, the um, the psycho scare scare zone out in front of the mummy. That yes, they had they were looking for those jump scares, but they would just come up and talk or like one where a, a girl just walk up and she was carrying a little teddy bear and just walk up beside our youngest and just walk alongside her not say anything <laughs> just kind of looking at her really strange and she didn't know what to make of it and it's just so good that you know that that's the standard of character interaction in the parks and it's a shame that they they can't translate that over yeah but again it's probably because it's a hard ticket event and yeah, that's what you're paying to get they've got a bigger budget for it yeah right we're getting towards the end i can't believe we've been going nearly an hour i want to <laughs> ask everyone in turn so get thinking, where do you see the future of character? Not Again, not, I don't want to say meet and greets because just characters in general in the parks, where do you think they are going to evolve? Do you think we, they are where they are or are we going to see more technology involved in them and I am going to go to the man who can talk more than anyone else to give everyone else a bit more time? John. Okay, uh, I've had all 30 uh, milliseconds to put my brain <laughs> together. Um, honestly, when it comes to character meet and greets, it all comes down to the person who is playing the character. Sure, you can automate things as an addition to the ones that are actually a person doing that job and doing it well. Yeah, You can add another layer of interaction that way but nothing is ever going to replace a really good really motivated actor or actress sorry for breaking the wall again <laughs> um you know it just those are the ones that you remember those are the ones that 
can break it all, you know, just make the illusion work so well that even someone like me who is used to, you know, the showbiz mentality falls into it and it becomes real. So that it, it is what it always has been. I just hope we don't, because we are starting to see, like I said, with the drivers on Kong and with the goblin in the money exchanging Gringotts, that we are getting away from those characters. It seems to be a little bit now, you are seeing live people in the parks, but it's more show, so like Celestina Warbeck or the Tale of the Three Brothers show or the Frog Choir um, we're seeing a lot of that, like the impromptu, I think, is it Let's Sing It that are in uh, New York as well, and then the Blues Brothers and that. I, we're seeing a lot more of that, whereas the actual character interactions seem to be going away a little bit. I can't honestly, other than the Raptor encounter, remember the last time they added one, probably the Night Bus Conductor at Diagon Alley, and what's that been open two years now? Yeah. At least. It'll be interesting to see what happens when Fast and Furious opens. Um, well, I mean, I know, I mean, it is what it is. The characters are going to be what they are right now. But what I would love to see, especially since um, NBC Universal bought out all the rights to the Harry Potter movies and such, I would love to see um, just ca- like characters that aren't really characters like I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to see like Harry, Hermione, because it's just, it's too hard to differentiate. Yeah. Just seeing them, you know, but like we could have the woman um, pushing the candy trolley. You could easily make her a character meet and greet almost, but you're also getting the candy that they sell at Honey Dukes and just going around Diagon Alley or near Hogwarts Express, something like that. Or um, we're seeing something like... um, like in Goblet of Fire, when you saw the Death Eaters walking around in a group. Well, it's like funny. Like something like that. It's funny you bring that up because I know they've just announced that they're going to have like a Death Eater thing in the Wizarding World over in Japan this year, aren't they? Which hopefully Get might out. open the way for something coming over to the States. Oh, that would be awesome. Just to get like more characters in that world, you know, in the parks. Because, you know, they've had so much on lock since Warner Brothers wouldn't let them do anything and, yes. and J.K. Rowling. But, you know, now that NBC Universal owns all of that content, they should be able to... And I know they've mentioned putting more stuff in the parks, more um, events and such. But if they could get characters that aren't, like, characters, that would be... That's where I would love to see them the most. Yeah, just to flesh out Hogsmeade, because you think Hogsmeade is supposed yeah. to be the only wizarding village in Britain, yet you don't see anyone there other well, than the people right. in the shops and the... Ex- yeah. Exactly. Just yeah. just to so, populate that area and make it feel like it is a real place. Exactly. Even just having them walk around, not even interacting with you, just yeah. walking around in costume, that's what I want. To, I want to be completely emerged into that experience, and I feel like that would just amp it up even more because i want to see in springfield and i've i've put this out there before to certain people they've ignored me but anyway um (laughs) i want to see a a barbershop quartet in springfield i think they could do the b sharps Uh, quite easily in there they could do that they could definitely especially when you look like they've they've brought a lot of that stuff like i've said with celestina warbeck and the frog choir in hogsmeade it's something they want to do so i think that would fit in there but again it probably comes down to a licensing thing yeah exactly and that's why i mentioned harry potter because they they have all this content that they own now so why not use it and attract even more people to the parks Go on then, Leo. You've had plenty of time to think now. <laughs> All right. Um, I think the next real leap we're going to see in any characters or character meet and greets are going to be on the south um, plot of land that Universal recently bought. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of that will tie in with the DreamWorks acquisition. Yeah. Um, I know one of the properties a lot of people seem really, really excited to see uh, come to the parks is How to Train Your Dragons. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> um, I bring that up because the company, um, Creature Technology, responsible for the Kong animatronic in Skull Island Reign of Kong, did a massive collection of How to Train Your Dragon animatronics and puppets for a How to Train Your Dragon traveling arena show. Ooh. That are... They are incredible. If you have you have an opportunity, check out their website. It's just creaturetechnology.com, and you can see videos of the um, the arena show. Um, they've also done like a um, a massive King Kong puppet um, for a traveling King Kong stage show from I think it was in Australia. Um, they also did all of the animatronics for the um, Jurassic World traveling exhibit. That's awesome. So they've done a lot of work with Universal, and um, so I I really see Universal kind of going in the, in the direction they kind of started with the Transformers, and then almost Dragon Challenge, and kind of kind of upping the technology they use in the in the meet and greets or the way they present the meet and greets. Um, I really do see you know getting to meet um, Toothless. Oh, that would be the um, biggest for my fan. Everyone in my family is such a huge fan of him. And if, if they could do a Raptor encounter style thing or even make it a little bigger, maybe, you know, Oh, I wouldn't know what they would do. And, and I'm sure I'm not, I'm not going to go check out that website, but, uh, <laughs> I know my family would be there in a second. Well, if you think yeah, it's the evolution awesome. of the, um, triceratops encounter that used to be in Jurassic park years ago. Good point. Yeah, to do something like that with That's toothless, true. I would be. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I know that we, my wife and I, talk quite often, saying that we hope that there is a "How to Train Your Dragon" section of that new park. It That'd makes. So cool. Yeah, I don't. I don't see how there could not be at this point. Of course, they're working on the next film, and it is such a popular franchise. So. I think it's second only to Shrek in the DreamWorks animation portfolio. So, <laughs> And apparently they're making wow. another one of them, and I don't think most people enjoyed them since the second one, did they? Yeah, I know I did. <laughs> Actually, I didn't the, mind the, them, but I'm the exception that proves the rule as usual. Well, God. the third one was terrible, but they brought it back around with the last one, but the first two were, were excellent. Yes. <laughs> cool. Right. Well, basically, what we think is the future of characters in the park is bright, and it is going to be full of technology. Do, we ever, do you think we'll see virtual reality part of a character thing or not? Is that a possibility or not? Because They coming. could do it so that you could be like battling people with wands. That I'd would be, be all cool. about that. Because it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Whether we like it or not, VR is coming to theme parks. Well, not, you know, to mention like the uh, virtual reality versus augmented reality, like Pokemon Go is augmented. It's got a, a yes. camera and then it superimposes that on there, you can really easily see that kind of technology be becoming real prevalent. And it's it's easier. You know, you don't have to create a whole world. You're just superimposing things. Yeah. Um, you know, you look oh. a little further. You look where that technology is going with, you know, projection and, you know, like they do on the, the stage shows now with the making holograms of the... You know, the rap star, the musician who died like 10 Tupac. years ago, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. As that comes more and more forward, that'll happen. I mean, it might not happen for 10 years. It might not happen for 15 years. But that stuff will be there one day. Oh, yeah. And to piggyback on what he just said, as far as the, the VR versus um, AR, augmented reality, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it, in a more fashion that we see um, AR in a um, in the Universal Parks before we see anything major with VR. Okay. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. That that is currently one of the, the big rumors around um, the Nintendo Edition. Okay. Is the use of augmented reality instead of screens in in um, one of the major rumored attractions. Wow. Ooh. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Awesome. I'm quite excited about it now. Think about something <laughs> as simple as like Agent P's, uh, you know, adventure in Epcot. Yes. Which you know was their way of keeping little kids entertained in the uh, <laughs> uh, World Showcase. 
you can take that so many steps further oh, yeah. with, you know, with this kind of technology. And in that world, it'd be a shoe in. Awesome. Right. Well, I'm going to have to stop it there, guys, because uh, this has been awesome. We've actually, <laughs> Universal, if you listen, you're welcome to all these ideas if you're not already working on them. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It's really weird not having Darren Hunter and Tracy here, but uh, it's been cool. And we've all had some really good, interesting ideas. I think the augmented reality, yeah, is, is very exciting. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Cool. Right. Well, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on to talk to us. That is going to wrap up episode 209 of the unofficial Universal Orlando podcast. So far, Ali, John and Leo, I have been Lee. Uh, and of course this has been the unofficial (laughs) universal orlando podcast that's it for another unofficial universal orlando podcast make sure you never miss a show by subscribing on itunes and while you're there please leave us a rating and a review listen to us on stitcher google play and all your podcast apps email us with any questions or comments to podcast at uuopodcast.com or even better record your message at speakpipe.com slash uuopodcast Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Pinterest, keyword UUO Podcast. Check out our blog for even more content at UUOPodcast.com. And finally, our sponsors, Fairy Godmother Travel, are here to help with all your universal vacation needs. So check them out today at FairyGodmotherTravel.com. Well, that's a wrap. See you next week.